A man received a promotion to vice president for his company. The promotion went immediately to his head and he bragged to everyone and anyone. His wife, so embarrassed by his behavior, said, listen, Bob, it's no big deal. These days, everyone's a vice president. Why, even they have a vice president of peas over the supermarket. Well, Bob had to call the supermarket to find out if this was true. Can I speak to the vice president of peas, he asked. The reply was, a fresh or frozen? <laughs> the title of my sermon at today is True Greatness in Christian Humility. Millennials were raised to believe in their own importance. They're a problem for older adults in the workplace. Many businesses are giving their managers special training to deal with these young people who are so full of their own importance. Of course, this attitude isn't new. It just seems more common today. God's word repeatedly tells us God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. If he gives grace to the humble, then being humble is the well-marked pathway to being blessed and spiritually successful. However, many people today do not have a clear understanding of what Christian humility is and don't see humility as being a virtue. This subject was a huge concern for the apostles. Paul, in his letters to the churches, had a lot to say about it. Today, I would like to just briefly cover some of what he was inspired to write about being a humble Christian. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. For you see your calling, brothers, that there's not many wise according to the flesh, nor many powerful, not many well-born. But God chose the foolish things of the world that the wise may be put to shame. And God chose the weak things of the world so that he might put to shame the strong things. And God chose the low-born of the world and the despised and the things that are not so that he might bring to nothing the things that are so that no flesh might boast in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who was made to us from God both righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so even as it has been written, he that boasts, let him boast in the Lord. Paul in these verses is pointing out to us that our humility that our humility agrees with God, agrees that God gets all the credit for choosing and calling us according to his purpose. There is nothing we did to merit his calling. Nothing. If there's any boasting to be done, verse 31, that goes to Christ. The point Paul is making here is that Christian humility is rooted in Christ's forgiveness of us. What did I do to deserve forgiveness? I think we would all like to believe in some way there was something good or something special, at least something better about us that makes us deserving of Christ's sacrifice and our calling. What does God say about that? He says, you were called because you're the bottom of the barrel type. He didn't call the smartest or the most deserving according to the world. He called the least. That means none of us has any reason not to be thankful and not to be humble. Understanding that you need forgiveness for sin, just like everyone else, and your sin is as bad as everyone else's, is the only kind of humility that pleases God, honors his son, Jesus Christ, and carries the day. True understanding that we are sinners, totally dependent on him, brings out humility. 
There's no reason for any of us, the foolish, the weak, to boast. The only blessing we, the only boasting that we can make is in God's love, his strength, his wisdom, and his forgiveness. When we fully learn to appreciate this, then we will be able to humbly pour ourselves out like Christ did for us. Paul told the Colossians, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, meekness, long-suffering, humility. And so as Christ forgave you, you also must forgive. We are told to put on humility. Humility isn't something that most people have. The worldly way is to compare yourself to others and put yourself above them. We have to put on humility, practice it, and get used to thinking of ourselves in a different way. Peter also said, be clothed in humility. What a person wears tells a lot about them. Police and firefighters wear uniforms so we know where to go to to get help. We should wear humility as our uniform so people will feel safe and comfortable around us. The way to wear Humility is to be meek, long-suffering, and kind. Humility, humility is the clothing of God's people. We're to put it on every day. We show the world and remind ourselves who we are. We should never forget God called you and me out of the world and believes that believes in promoting self. We are supposed to let that attitude go. Some of the greatest instruction in the Bible on humility was given to the Philippian church. They were told not to act out of selfish ambition or conceit, but with humility think of others better than yourself. And be concerned about the interest of others. Have the same attitude that was also in Jesus who took the form of a slave. Paul is pointing out that Christian humility seeks to serve in unity. Paul doesn't men mention unity, but it's his subject throughout. But with all, but with all humility, humility, think of others being better than yourself. The word better in this verse can be defined as superior. Superior. Now that's a pretty high standard. How do we consider others superior to ourselves? Paul gives the answer. Do not act off out of selfish ambition or conceit. In other words, don't go around promoting yourself. Labor for the betterment of the whole body. Concern for their needs. Do you know what's in another person's heart? We may think we do sometimes. We might be right, we might be wrong. Gloria has lived with me for 51 years and knows me better than anyone in this room. Yet, she doesn't know what's going on in my heart all the time or I in hers. Even though we don't know the heart of someone, or maybe because we can't know the heart. We should think of them better than ourselves. Be concerned about their interests and needs. Why? There's a heart I do know. Mine. And I know mine so well that I do not measure up. Think of it this way. I know sin that's in my heart more than the sin that's in anybody else's, right? So if I want to get first-hand info about who's failed the worst in this room, who do I look to? Come on, be honest. If we're honest with ourselves and say, I don't know what's in another person's heart, but I do know what's in mine, then I can put myself in a position to where 
I can consider others superior to myself. When I look in Paul, at Paul and say, Paul, you're the greatest Christian that ever lived. If Paul were here, what do you think would be Paul's answer? Is that the answer? Is that the way Paul thought of himself? No. Someone might say, oh, Paul had a false sense of humility. Not true. Because the person Paul knew best was who? Paul. And Paul said he was the least of the apostles and not fit to be called because he knew himself. Remember, he persecuted God's chosen. Now, this, is, this perspective might help us to look at others in a different view. This also, should be, this also should affect how we serve, not from a top-down perspective, with me at the top in charge, but from an opposite point of view, the view of being a servant, the lowest ranking person in the room, serving everyone else. You know what made Jesus mad? He told us. You load people with burdens, some of them hard to bear. And you don't lift a finger to help them. The Son of Man came to serve, not to be served. He came to serve us. The air you breathe, the food you eat, the water you drink, the salvation he brought. God serves us every day of our lives. Think about that. We should have this mind serving our Lord and others. How you serve affects the unity of the body. Humility doesn't measure everything by how good it makes me look or how it builds my reputation in the church. Paul said, help others. Put them in the light. Serve them. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit. Again, just the opposite point of view the world thinks. Boy, this is a high standard, isn't it? Using our energy to be concerned about everyone else's cause and their needs. Eliminate selfishness. Eliminate empty conceit. The world says you have to wash out for yourself. God says, watch out for others, and I'll watch out for you. Unity of, the, unity of the body depends on us being humble enough to be concerned with the interest of others who need our concern and prayers. Yes, this is a very high standard for us all, and our Lord demands it. If we don't do these things, there will always be conflict because we will only see our little piece of the pie and not see the whole picture. In closing, let's go to Mark 10, 42 to 45. Paul says, have this attitude that was in Jesus Christ. Christ is our model, our standard. He did nothing out of selfishness. He did nothing out of empty conceit. Christ became a curse for us. Our Creator became our Savior, putting the needs of you and me and all of humanity above himself. And he says, follow me. He asks us to have the same humility, same attitude, putting others first. Live your life in service to God and to each other. Let's read Mark 10, 42 to 45. But having called them near, Jesus said to them, You know that those seeming to rule the nations lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. This shall not be so among you. Whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever desires to become first he shall be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
Those who know Christ know what true greatness is. Let's ask God to help us put all humanity and to serve one another so that we can truly be united with him and each other.